Hi, good morning. This is the third time I've started this video because the first time I didn't like the chapter I chose and the second time all the pets decided to come and make a racket and be annoying. So <laughs> let's start again. Um, right, so my aim for this week is to review a book a day for you and film it and send it you and then you can see my face <laughs> every day <laughs> this week um we'll see how well that goes at least i don't have to worry about running out of books because i have a lot um and i do actually have a lot of teen fiction as well because oh, i was a teenager for a while <laughs> um and I read a lot of really good books then and I kept them all. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I have a real problem with throwing away books or donating them or giving them away. Um, especially if it's one that left me feeling a certain way um, or affected me at a certain time in my life when I needed to be affected or um, just really made me happy or sad or anything I, I really struggle with getting rid of them then it's like that book represents some part of my life um, I like a lot of series is is um, because if I find a good book and then it's like, oh, there's another one, here's part two, I just love that. Um, so, yeah, some of the books I'll probably find at some point and go over may well be a series, but for today's book, it is not part of a series. It is by one of my, I would still call him one of my favourite authors, even though, I've got cat hair, um, even though I, I haven't read any of his books for years, um, probably not since I was a teenager and actually I don't think he's released as much since um, so yeah um, so his name is Melvin Burgess and the book I'm going to focus on today is called Junk okay I realize this is back to front now um, I can't change that so yeah <laughs> um, so Junk is I don't know I guess a bit controversial in some way, in some ways but it is a children young adult book um, and it is really good um, it covers drug use um, there is some bits about sex in it um, but it's that's not really the main well not the hugest focus or anything um and the main point that it covers is drugs and um two young people that run away from home um and i've kind of remembered a bit more of it now but one of the big things that it does cover is it's very much a book that starts off you know the about these two young teenagers um, and they've really idealised this idea of running away. One of them has a good reason for wanting to, and one of them doesn't really. Um, and what's also really interesting is it does go over how the parents feel to a point. And, and I remember that being quite poignant and interesting, and it really brings you into it as well. Because, um, I mean... When I was 14, there was probably a lot of the times I did stuff and I didn't really think about how my parents felt about it. Um, whether that was having a massive argument with them or whatever. Um, but yeah, so it, it's a really interesting book. As I say, it does cover themes of drugs, um, not in a positive way, but it does kind of start off in that way of it's them experiencing them and then them realising if it's positive or negative um, rather than it just being like drugs are bad from the beginning or anything. Um, I would say it doesn't idealise them though. Um, I think 
definitely after reading this, I was like, well, I'm never doing heroin. <laughs> um, not that I had any plans to do that before, but it really, um, it really showed me a side of it and everything. And I remember um, looking into this book afterwards and being like, was this a true story? Um, is this autobiographical? Because it's written so well, or at least it felt like it was when I was 14. Um, so it's a really easy read, okay? It's quite a thick book depending on, well, how, what kind of books you're into. Um, I remember this was one of my first ones that was like, this is a thick book. <laughs> and, but it's got quite a big, a reasonably sized font and it has a huge border around the outside. So actually, there's not that much to read. Um, it's, yeah, it's just really interesting. I'll read you the blurb. So, junk equals heroin, equals bliss, equals despair, equals a love story you'll never forget. Gemma wants to fly, but no one can fly forever. One day, somehow, finally, you have to come down. Groundbreaking and controversial from one of today's most important writers. Um, yeah, so I'm going to, I was originally going to read the first chapter and then I changed my mind because I didn't like it. I mean, it's a good chapter, but I, I didn't feel like it gave you a good snip it I can hear my cat trying to get into this room he will push on so one of the things that um I think this may have been the first book I read which was like this and I realized I love this style of writing which is each chapter except for the first one I mean I don't remember all the chapters but just about each chapter is um written in from the perspective of a different person. So you get the two main characters are Gemma and Tar. Um, so most of them are alternating from their perspectives, but there's also a few from different people as well. So I remember finding that really, really interesting. Um, so sometimes you'll see the same situation, but from two different people's perspectives, which again, um, I think it really helps with that kind of empathy and being like, oh, okay, well, this person felt like this, but actually this person felt completely different. Um, so, yeah, I loved that. <coughs> so we're going to start with chapter three, um, which is from the perspective of Tar. Just to give you a little overview. So Tar has run away um, from an abusive relationship with his dad. Um, Gemma doesn't have a bad relationship with her parents um but obviously um they're not very pleased with her because she spends a whole night out they have no idea where she is um but they know she'll have been with tar now her perspective is obviously well he really needed her um and you know they, they didn't have sex they didn't do anything like that um she literally just stayed with him um and what well, you know the night he was running away um so it again it's interesting because you can see her perspective um but the parents perspective is well we had no idea where you are you could have anything could have happened to you you're 14 um and you know we worried about you and we're angry because we've got no idea what you've been doing um so yeah that's kind of past um so tar so tar has already run away me and Gemma, you'd never have believed it i didn't start off when she first turned up on the beach i thought i wasn't going to like her it was saturday night We'd built a big fire opposite the old factory sheds about half a mile out of town. It was a good big fire. We'd found a huge lump of wood, part of an old boat. Me and Kenny dragged it up the beach. It was tarred and it had copper nails in it. The copper turned the fire green. It was magic. Gemma was wild about it. She gets so excited by things. That's one of the things I like about her. She was excited by the fire by meeting us for the first time, by the sound of the sea in the dark, by the night. <sighs> Mine leads to the most awful dump. 
No one's got any time for the locals. You wander around in your own town feeling like an outsider and then you find this bunch of people your own age sitting half a mile out of town by the magic fire drinking and smoking and doing their own thing. I remember when I discovered the beach life. It's great. She was beautiful, but she was going on and on, rattling away about how wonderful this was and how wonderful that was. She was getting drunk and stoned and I thought, doesn't she ever get tired of her own voice? But I stayed and she stayed and in the end there was only about five or six of us left. That's usually the, that's the time I usually went home. And the later it got, the more people got paired off until in the end, if you were sitting there on your own, you turned into a gooseberry. I usually tried to leave before that happened. But that night I was there and Gemma was there and all the others were pairing off and I thought, oh no. Because in that situation, I always feel as though I ought to try and make a move, but I didn't dare. And I didn't want to just go and leave because everyone was, no, I was scared to talk to her. You'd have to be a lot more sure of yourself than I am to pull a girl like her. She came and sat next to me and started talking. There were those long silences. I was anxious, she'd be fed up, um, but she didn't seem to mind. Then she started asking me about myself. And I told her about home and mum and dad. I felt like stupid, you know, because everyone knows about my problems. And here I was talking about them to this beautiful girl. I thought she must be dead bored by it. But she kept asking me about things in a quiet voice, not like the voice she used when she was hooting and yelling earlier. I told her everything, everything, too much. I kept looking at her thinking, why are you asking all these questions? What have you got to do with me? Then she started talking to somebody else and I thought, oh well. And the next thing I knew, I could feel her fingers tickling my hand. I couldn't believe it. I thought it was some mistake. We held hands. Then I picked up all my courage and I put my arm around her waist and she leaned into me. And I just smiled. I was so pleased. I couldn't kiss her, I was smiling so much. Ow, she said when I banged her mouth with my teeth. I told her, I'm so happy. Good, she said, good. When I rang her up that Tuesday after I left home and she told me she was coming to see me, my face went like it did that first night. I was grinning like an idiot. People were smiling at me as I was walking away from the telephone box. It was great. I'd been feeling pretty down being away from home, being on my own. Now I felt great. I wanted to take that moment. I wanted to make that moment last as long as I could, like in a film. You know how they play a song or some music and a particular feeling stretches out like that. I should have been in a boat floating down the river or in a hot air balloon with someone playing a guitar. But there I was in the middle of this tatty old Bristol street and I knew that any second something had happened and I'd be feeling dreadful again. I had to do something. Then I thought, I'll go for a walk in the park. Yeah, there'd be toddlers on the roundabouts, people walking the dogs. It was late spring. The daffodils were still out. There were trees in bloom. People would be feeding the ducks and the pigeons. I could have an ice cream. I had my Walkman with me so I could even have some music if I wanted. I could feel that moment lifting up, ready to jump into the air. I put my hand in my pocket. I don't know why. I had a quid and I thought, shit. Because I'd already left it too late and I could feel that good feeling going down the drain. The th thing was, if I spent my money on ice cream, I'd have to go into town and beg in the pedestrian precinct, the dusty bowl, they call it, the dust bowl. So I could get something to eat that night and begging is so grim. There's no way you can do it nicely. You just put your head down between your knees and hold your hand out and try to pretend it's not happening. It was so stupid, as if I had to have money to feel good about Gemma coming to see me. I knew it was going to happen. I knew there was just too much rubbish about to let me feel good for more than a second. The moment gathered itself up and jumped up into the air. I was left on the ground watching it go. 
and then I noticed the dandelions. They were on the grass verges along the road. It was a solid mass of yellow, bright golden yellow. I've been standing there thinking about daffodils somewhere else and all the time there were dandelions, wild dandelions, not put from there for me to look at, but there because they wanted to be there. All along the grubby street, it was ablaze with yellow and everyone was walking up and down without even noticing them. I must have walked past them a dozen times. I walk about without seeing sometimes. I know it sounds stupid, but it was like the flowers had come out for Gemma. I stood there for a bit and I felt like I was soaking up that colour. I love yellow. It's the colour of sunlight. When all this is over and I get myself sorted out, I want to go to art college. I want to be a painter or a designer. I really think I'm good enough. I stood there staring at it and I had an idea for a painting, a dandelion, just one huge bright dandelion. The background was all black and the dandelion was all the bright yellows and oranges, every petal a long yellow triangle. It would be a big painting. I was going to do it and put it on the wall of the squat for Gemma when she came. And that big happy moment came swooping down and I reached up a hand and caught hold of it and off I went. I picked a big bunch of dandelions and went off back to the squat. I felt great again. I say squat, it was more of a dairy really, but I'd been trying to clear it out a bit the past day or two. The first couple of nights I slept out in doorways the very first night, I tried to go to sleep in my bag in the doorway of a small supermarket, but it was too cold. I ended up wandering about all night. Towards morning, I saw people crowded together in a subway, all wrapped up and in cardboard boxes. And I thought, that's how you do it. And I wandered about some more till I found some cardboard in stacks outside a shop waiting for the bin men. I wrapped myself up in that and that was better. But you still keep waking up all night. You never seem to get a decent night's sleep on the street. I slept like that for a couple of nights, but I didn't like it on the street. The thing is, you're in public. People can see you all the time, even when you're asleep. Sometimes at night you wake up and the police are shining a torch in your face. I hated that. The thought of people examining you while you're asleep. All those strangers. I began to feel like something in a zoo. So when I found this row of dairy houses, I thought, right, this is going to be home. I found a little room with a door still on it. The first night, I kept getting woken up by people bang banging in. It was pitch black, so they couldn't see me till I called out. It happened about five times that night. I was really scared the first few times, but after a bit, I realised it was just people looking for a place to sleep. I shouted out, it's taken, and they left. The next day, I made up a little sign, do not disturb, and I wrote property of Hotel de Erelict in little letters underneath. Everyone had to find their way about with matches or a torch, so they all saw my sign, and I never get bo got bothered about after that. Just a couple of times, some drunks came charging in without seeing my notice. Sometimes they thought it was funny, so funny they'd wake me up. Will you leave your boots outside for cleaning? Someone yelled. And will Sir be requiring his breakfast in bed? That sort of thing. That was okay. It was out of the open, but it was a right mess in there. People had dumped bin bags full of rubbish, waste paper, old clothes, even rubble. I slept on top of that for a few nights. I suppose I was feeling depressed. I was thinking a lot about my mum. Then I thought, get on with it. First of all, I scooped all the rubbish into bin bags and carried it out around the back. I pinched the bin bags from someone's dustbin, I found a broken broom and a skip and gave it a good brush down. It was still a tip, but at least it was a brush tip. Since then, I've been collecting bits and pieces. A few wooden crates, a bit of carpet someone chucked out. I couldn't make it too nice because someone would have nicked stuff or wrecked it, but I tried to make it mine. That's why I was so pleased when I had this idea for a picture. I wanted to do a picture. I brought my pencils with me, but I hadn't got round to it yet. And I had this great idea for Gemma. It was about two minutes back to the squat. On the way, I had to go past Joe Skull's tobacconists. I thought I'd go in and have a Twix, have a treat. 
I completely forgot about the begging. You do. You just forget and you buy a chocolate bar and then you think, oh no. Joe Skull's a nice man. He'd given me a few quid a couple of times in the past few days. I think he gave quite a bit of money to the people on the street. You look full of the joys today, David, he said. I and my dandelions over the counter. Yeah, my girlfriend's coming to stay, I told him. I think I only went in there so I could tell someone on the news. Hence the bouquet, eh? He said, nodding at the dandelions. Yeah, I laughed. I took a Twix bar and dug in my pocket for the money. He didn't laugh, but then he never did. He always kept his face completely straight, except his eyebrows were permanently up in the air. You hardly ever saw him move his face, even when he was cracking you up with laughter. Deadpan. That's good news then. He didn't take my money. He just looked at me. Leaving her folks like you did, is she? He wanted to know. I looked at him. Yeah? How old is she then, David? I didn't tell him about how old she was. I said... I didn't dare tell him how old she really was. I said, 16. That's how old I told him I was. I started eating the Twix to hide my embarrassment. Nice. He stood there with his hands hanging by his sides watching me. Where are you putting her up then? I was beginning to feel miserable again. Honeymoon suite at the Hotel Derry. Yeah. I put the money back in my pocket. Thank you, Scully, for the free Twix bar. Oh, yeah, I'm really sorry. I was thinking, that's all right. Not a nice place for a young lady, though, is it, da David? I just hadn't thought. He was right. Albany Road was all right for me, but not for Gemma. You get all sorts there. Tramps, alcoholics, junkies. Most of them are all right, but some of them, once or twice, I've seen the alkies with women with them, but you never see any young women in there. The girls all sleep in the doorways in public. And I've thought, why? Here, I held out the money again, but he waved it away. Don't be daft. I was about to put it back put it back in my pocket, but then I had second thoughts. No, take it or I won't be able to keep I won't be able to keep coming in. Uh you'll think I'm begging a time and a place for everything, eh, David? I take your point. I'll give it back to you later on, okay. I laughed. He was so funny. His face was funny. He was quite fat and bold. And he always looked as if you'd just given him a mildly unpleasant surprise, as if you'd told him the price of chocolate had just gone up or something. Life is a complicated business, he said. Another came, a customer came in and he turned to them. He nodded and I started for the door. Then he called out, hang on a minute. I stood and waited until he sold a newspaper. I felt dreadful again. I hadn't thought. I was being selfish. I couldn't ask Gemma to come and live like this with me. She's not coming to stay. She's just visiting, I began when the customer left. What are you doing tonight? Well, nothing. Be here at six o'clock. I've got someone to see. We might be able to sort something out for you. Really? I've got, I've got to see someone, all right? You be here at six. I, just, I might just tell you to clear off home. Thanks, Mr. Skull. Mr. Skull, he rolled his eyes briefly. Scully. Thanks, Scully. Go on. I practically skipped down the road. Everything was working out. Gemma coming, Scully taking me on. Well, I say that, but of course not everything was going to work out. There was one thing that never was going to, and that was the really big one. My mum. I'd made myself this promise not to ring up for a whole month. The trouble was, I kept thinking I'd feel better if I spoke to her, but I knew it wasn't true. I'd left her a note when I went, but that was ages ago. I, it was Gemma's idea not to ring her for a bit. She said my mum would just make me feel really bad. Maybe she'd even talk me into coming back. But things were going so well, I was thinking maybe I could cope with it. I'd only been away a couple of weeks, but it was the longest I'd ever been away from her. I knew I shouldn't ring. Gemma was right. You don't know my mum. She can make you do anything. I'm more scared of her than I am of dad, really. In the end, I thought, see what happens tonight with Mr. Skull. I mean, if he got me sorted out with somewhere to live, everything would be okay and I could think about getting in touch with mum. If not, well, that'd be different. That'd be a disaster. 
I'll have to ring up Gemma and tell her not to come because Scully was right. You couldn't ask Gemma to come and live in a place like Albany Road. The dandelion didn't come out like I wanted. The colours were too pale. I wanted these really deep yellows and the black like velvet behind it. You can't do that sort of thing with pencil crayons. Pastel sticks would have done it. I had a set at home. I was really mad with myself for not bringing them. They're so fragile. I thought they'd get broken. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's an another one that's not really brilliantly happy, but it's, I don't know, I guess maybe the best books in my opinion. You have to have a bit of something to make it interesting. And yeah, it's, it's a really interesting book. I really loved it when I first read it. And actually, again, I'm reading it now and I'm thinking, I can't fully remember everything that happens. But actually, I think this is one, it stuck with me so much, I remember how it ends and I can kind of remember how they get from where they are in that point to where it ends. So actually, I could probably tell this story off by heart, even though I've, I can't remember the last time I read it. Um, so yeah, so that's Melvin Burgess. I really went through a huge phase of really loving his work and I, I would still count him as one of my favourite authors even though I don't really read his work anymore I haven't actually seen anything come out from him for quite a while now um, and yeah it, even though he's more of a teen fiction I don't mind that um, I've kind of I just like reading books so yeah, I, if you if you get a moment, if you think it sounds interesting, I would recommend. It's a really interesting book. Um, it's not a hard read. It really goes really quick, and it's one of those that you go, oh my god, I'm near the end. Um, and the end of it is really interesting. Um, obviously, I won't give you any spoilers, um, but it's just interesting reading about their life, and because it's got that whole um, each chapter being from somebody else's point of view, it's. It, it really keeps the pace really nicely. Um, obviously, as I say, it does cover um, a few sensitive topics for some, so drugs, um, being being on the street. Um, there is, um, Tar or David is running away from an abusive family relationship. Um, so just bear that in mind. But it's definitely a kind of coming of age, um, interesting teen fiction and it doesn't feel like the author is patronizing anybody um i remember reading it and feeling really like yeah i mean this is you know i felt like this at points and and this is more of like what it's like to be a young teen rather than it being like oh here's some adult telling me how i'm supposed to be feeling and everything so yeah it's really good um so yeah, so that's my book for today. Hopefully I'll be able to upload this video quicker um, than I did yesterday because it just took me ages to work out how to get it properly on there. Um, so let's see how that goes. And I hope you have a lovely day and yeah, bye.